The Catholics of Oz is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 52 of The Catholics of Oz. The Catholics of Oz is a show where we discuss faith, culture, and what's been happening from an Aussie perspective. Whether it's synods or science, apostolates and apps, providence or productivity, you can hear it right now on The Catholics of Oz. Hello, my name is Lindsay Sands and welcome to episode 52 of The Catholics of Oz. Very happy to have you all with us today. And today I am joined by Lino Sabol. Lino, how are you going? I'm good, Lindsay. How is everybody? Yeah, I think everyone's going well here. Uh, now, let's just let everyone know it is the two of us again. But yes. we, uh, we did. Caroline did pre warn everyone. Yes, she so did. She's, yes. Yeah. yeah. I actually yeah. don't know what the um what the holiday leave contracts are like at SQPN. But I, I mean, I Caroline's. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. We, I don't think we get annual leave or long service leave in this show, man. I, I we don't get paid, so that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I guess maybe Caroline's going to be called in for a meeting. <laughs> discuss her future on the network <laughs> none of that's going to happen yeah oh no, just... <laughs> oh no. love you caroline yeah. love you <laughs> yes now actually caroline is um is taking a short family holiday over the weekends um with her family because they um her husband phil is doing a show in torquay so we're a bit jealous um oh. and uh so i mean you know if your husband's doing a show in torquay you take, torquay, a, you take a holiday yeah. four places why not oh, yeah, i mean you know awesome that's, that's a no-brainer there. right yeah exactly exactly <laughs> yeah Maybe after we record this show, we should go join them. Just go crash the party. Oh, I'll get my um you know, personal helicopter, guys. We are on the way there. Oh, cool. We all know your personal helicopter is about the size of a human hand leader. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's remote controlled. About like two AA batteries. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm going to have the giggles now. So before we continue, <laughs> uh, we'd like to remind everyone, please, uh, if you see any posts about the Catholics of Oz on SVUPN's Facebook page, please give them a like and, and leave us a lovely comment about what you think about our shows. Um, and you can find those posted at facebook.com slash starquestmedia. And also our shows are posted on Twitter with the SQPN handle at SQPN. If you're a new listener to the Catholics of Oz, please go ahead and subscribe. We'd love for you to be part of our our uh, our, our lineup. Just uh, as listening to us uh, we, um, fortnightly as we, as we produce shows, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast player. And if you happen to have any kind of digital voice assistant before robots take over the world and they serve us, well, before we start serving them, um, they can play our podcast. So um, if you just use whatever they're called, because I can't say their name without setting mine off or yours while you're listening, uh, just say hey digital assistant person robot um you know what is it master one master. day um, oh no oh no uh yeah play uh the, play the catholics of oz and it should work it's it's worked for me like i always say i'm not going to do a demonstration because it's the one time when i do a demo that's not going to work so yeah. um, we won't do that um <laughs> SQPN also hosts all of the Catholics of Oz episodes on YouTube. So you can just search for SQPN on YouTube and you can subscribe there if that's where you prefer to subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell to get notifications when new episodes of the Catholics of Oz and of course other episodes of shows from SQPN are also released. And please, uh, any positive feedback, any five-star ratings that you leave on uh, any podcasting uh, networks or directories are good for us. It helps to reach more people. And in these times and in all times, it's something that we are really, really all about is reaching out to people and um, sharing some good news and, and sharing a bit of fun, a bit of faith, a bit of science, a bit of everything else. So, uh, Lino, are you ready to go? We're ready to go. Well, I am, right. sorry. We're, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm assuming you're speaking for both of us, don't worry. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Still thinking about helicopters. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> so um, let's start with Faith Beyond Borders. Well, I'm actually feeling rather good about this. I think we've all arrived at a very special place, eh? Oh. Spiritually, ecumenically. How do you make somebody love you without affecting free will? Welcome to my world, son. You come up with an answer to that one, you let me know. Yes, I had to work very hard to pass Latin and theology. Oh, quite. Those are, of course, the most important things. Oh, yeah. I'd sit this one out, Cap. I don't see how I can. These guys come from legend. They're basically gods. There's only one god, ma'am. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. So, Lino, 
I, yep. I am going to say this is your fault, okay? Oh, I, no. Here we I, go. I reserve the right to say this is your fault. I'm going to tell you a little story oh. about um, what happened or where I was last Wednesday night. Now, now this is Wednesday, St. Patrick's Day um, at time of recording. So uh, last Wednesday, St. Patrick's Day, um, I ended up um, at, the, uh, at the Patrick Oration with, uh, for 2021, which is um, a speech that's uh, delivered by Archbishop Comensoli, friend of the show, previous yeah, guest, definitely. hopefully future guest very, very soon as well. We're oh, hoping as well. Yep. Hoping to line Ooh, that up. Yep. Um, but uh, so uh, last Friday, so the Friday before that Wednesday, um, I received a, an email and I was, I was oh, surprised. Hey, <laughs> uh, I, I'll say unexpected, but, um, but greatly appreciated. I received an email from, um, from Annie, who's his chancellor, um, inviting me to come along to, uh, to uh, be part of this speech and, and to come for dinner. So there, I think there are approximately 100 guests or so that were there. And, um, and I could see that uh, he wanted to deliver this speech to a broad range of, of Catholics and also non-Catholics as well. So he also had representatives from um, the Jewish faith tradition, the Islamic Council. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, there was a, yeah, there was a, I think he was a, um, Archbishop Free. He's an Anglican bishop or possibly a retired Anglican bishop. I, I, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and then some politicians as well. So, um, oh, okay. also, yeah, so some Victorian politicians uh, present as well, uh, as well as Catholics from parish life, from different ministries, uh, from all kinds of places, you know, up and down the, the chain, the hierarchy of, you know, wow. um, of Ooh. Catholicism in Melbourne, which was good to see. Um, a couple of them were actually lecturers that uh, that taught me at CTC when I was doing my theology degree, oh, which is awesome. Liz. So hey. yeah, so I actually got to catch up with um, with Father Kevin Lenahan, which was really awesome because cool. he was one of my one of my favorite lecturers. I, I remember um, he uh, he was teaching me at a very pivotal point in my uh, in my theology degree where nice. I, I was about halfway through. I did it. Took me eleven years to get it done because I did it extremely part time. Wow, eleven and years, Liz. Yeah, Whoa. eleven years, and Oof. I was just about the halfway point. I was ready to hang up my boots and and wow. stop. I was okay. losing a bit of confidence in my ability and. Uh, things that he, that Father Kevin did that he didn't know about, <laughs> um, actually gave me the confidence um, and the drive to keep going. Oh, and cool. uh, just as a as a side note, I actually got to mention that to him at that night, which was nice. um, really I'd been waiting years and years to tell him. So it was great to be able to say to say thank you for that boost that you gave me. Yeah, nice, um, nice. Yeah. So why do I say it's your fault that I ended up at this event, Lino? Yeah, let, go on, go ahead, go ahead. Let, yeah. All right. So yeah. Lino is basically responsible for Archbishop Comensoli discovering the Catholics of Oz awesome. um, and, and the work yep. that we do, which is great. And, and he mentioned something like, it would be great to have him on the show if we re- could get to know him. <laughs> so the Archbishop had reached out to us last year, um, which was awesome. It was great. Uh, he reached out to us and, uh, and we had him on the show. We had a really great episode with him last year um, and uh, uh, such a great discussion that we had. Yes, we did. Uh, we mm-hmm. noted at the time just how... Um, down to earth and among the people he is as an he archbishop, is, um, definitely. And yeah, we'd had a we'd had an opportunity to meet him previously. Um, it must have been the year before, I think, when he'd visited our parish at Holy Family. So, um, yeah, just being really grateful for the work that he's done. So, can, speaking of the work that he's done, Lino. Uh, um, so, because of you, <laughs> no, <laughs> no uh, I'm, I'm just um, I'm digging in a bit there, digging in a bit. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so uh, I ended up at um, at this uh, at this speech at this at this dinner, um, which was wonderful. And obviously, the highlight was the Patrick Oration itself. So it's called the Patrick Oration because it's delivered on St. Patrick's Day, and um, and Archbishop Comensoli delivered um, his second oration. So he, uh, my understanding is he didn't do one last year because of the COVID lockdown. Um, yeah, so this is basically his second one as Archbishop of Melbourne. So uh, it was broadcast on YouTube. Um, and we'll share a link to that in the show notes. Um, and just as a side note, SQPN has actually shared that on their Facebook page as well. So that link is there um, for people to watch. And it was also broadcast on Channel 31. So uh, behind the scenes, I saw there was a they had cameras set up. They had a, a camera guy. You know, wow. They had a like, guy on the soundboard controlling. And you'd be like, all right, everyone, 30 seconds. You know, the whole... You know, oh, joking. No yeah, way. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, of course, of the channel. Up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. So that was yeah. great. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Um, mm. Yeah, and um, I rewatched it later to get some notes for today, and um, and all I could see was the back of my head from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was anyway. a cameo of you, Liz, but I wasn't. Yeah. Even, I wasn't sure if you're nodding. Uh, don't get me. Don't get me. I don't know what it was, man. But are you either nodding or you're you're just closing your eyes for a few seconds and opening them up a little bit? 
Lizzie? Uh, can I say, uh, I was I was definitely nodding at some key parts, which I'll talk about today. There definitely. was a lot. Um, for me, this speech, I would say, is, I don't want to say a turning point, and I don't want to make a big deal of it, but I do think it is, I do think it is good for Catholics in Melbourne and even Catholics around the, the Universal Church to take note because the theme of, of parish life and, and what is a parish and, and, you know, where are the lay apostles of today uh, really came through. And I think, uh, you know, if you're setting a vision or a mission for the, um, for the, for your own archdiocese and archbishop, I think the words, I think, I think it would be a shame if these words didn't get as far as the night itself. I think it'd be yeah, good for yeah, these yeah. words to reach out to parishes and, and for everyone to know about it. Exactly. So um, exactly, exactly. it'd be great if it, yeah, if it reached out into the, every part of the church in Melbourne, but we'll talk about that as well later on too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I thought today, cause Lena, you had a chance to watch it as well. Um, so I thought maybe you and I would just do a bit of a breakdown of some of the key things. We actually hope to have the archbishop on and, and get his thoughts and, and ask him lots of questions about it. So this will be our thoughts and our interpretation, and then um, the Archbishop can come on and tell us we're wrong and then correct us completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so um, basically he said a couple of things. He said two years ago, uh, he, he delivered the Patrick Oration, and he said in the, in the previous two years, he said, I spoke of the need to replant the gospel into our local neighborhoods of grace, our homes and communities, our movements, organizations, our parishes and schools. And I called for current day St. Patrick's would be the saint plant, so the seed planters of our time. And this is after he used the image of, uh, of bread. Uh, he was saying how people in lockdown, uh, one of the things that they started doing in our, in our lockdown was making bread. Bread and sourdough. <laughs> sourdough. Yeah. Sorry, it's sourdough. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yep, um, yep. And I, I can say that happened in our household. Did, uh, did Bernie yeah. have a go <laughs> making any bread later? Did she get, any, did she get the Maltese baking on at all? Or? No, no, not this no. <laughs> Not this time. Not, <laughs> Not this time. time. Next lockdown. Next lockdown. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully no, no more lockdowns. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, well, yes, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he, this was, I hadn't seen the previous Patrick oration, but it seems like this was part two. This was for, from what he was going at. This was the extension, the, the growth of what he'd established in the first one. And he started by talking about um, how he used the image of moving out of exile, which is a very Old Testament image. So we, we know of... Um, there are different kinds of exiles in the in the Old Testament, but in particular, I'm, I, I think he's referring to the Babylonian exile when the um, when the Jewish people are uh, taken out of out of um, their homeland and placed in Babylon and live in this foreign land that isn't theirs and lament. So it's it's almost like a lockdown in a sense because they are taken away from everything that they know and love. Love. Um, yep. Yep. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so he said, as we tentatively move out of lockdown, perhaps we can learn from the faith of our ancestors in finding our identity by way of our households. And so he used the image of the, the domestic or the home church. And he said, uh, for example, um, he said when the, uh, when the Israelites were taken out of, um, uh, out of Babylon and, went and, and restored back to their homelands and Nehemiah drawing up a list um, of the identity of people by way of their families so that no one would be left behind. And he said, now we move further down history um, and we look at Jesus. He, a lot of his ministry was time he spent in family homes. Um, and he, uh, he, said, he said they were the familiar and life-giving households along the pilgrim way of his journey. So he went to homes. He said he laughed with people. He cried with people. He healed people. He was you know, there amongst people. God made man in the flesh. All that, you know, God, God amongst us. And then from, from the homes, he launched into the last part of his ministry, which leads to his, you know, his death and resurrection. Um, yeah. And then he said, um, and he said, not surprisingly, then the church continued to be a household thing in the early church. It was where, where people gathered was in ordinary locations, um, exactly. at the household yep. churches. Uh, and that's where the support happens. The teaching of the faith, the, um, looking after the poor, all these kinds of things happened in the, in the early household church. So what he did then is, is link that to our time today to, and to our, our last 12 months when we were in our own uh, lockdown in Victoria in, in, to, in 2020. And he said, over the last 12 months, we have suffered through the experience of our places of worship being locked to the visitor and the person in need. And you, you and I could talk about this for ages, Lino, about what it's yeah. like to not have access to our churches. Um, oh, it, yeah. Well, f- physically in a sense, hey, man. Yeah. You know, even though we, we can see it through YouTube and through our social medias and everything, it, I, the physicality of it, 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 you do miss it. And especially our sacraments of Holy Communion and uh, if, just just being at Mass, you know, at Mass. Uh, what about something as simple as, why don't you tell everyone what we've been doing for the sign of peace, Lino? What, what we did during lockdown? 
Oh, Silent Abyss. What was it again? Oh, man, my mind made me so bad. Oh, with our WhatsApp, with our WhatsApp um, chat. Definitely. We have a group saying uh, sign a piece to, to everyone, for who, you know, all friends and family within it. And it's great. Oh, I like that. Yep. I understand when you mean sign a piece. When you say sign a piece, I think it was something more broader, man. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm just, <laughs> just about the, the, the handshake that Sorry. happens at Mass. Yeah, handshake. <laughs> yeah. Sign a piece. I'm like, yeah. okay, we're talking about something broader for this segment. Sorry, Matt. All good, all good. <laughs> no, no. I'm being very down to earth. Um, <laughs> but, but I was thinking... Um, uh, but even even that I missed because uh, you know it, it sounds so silly, but it's it's part of the connection to the community, exactly. and the connection to Christ, the people of God as well. Um, that that you get through, um, you know, through uh, through being at mass. So being physically locked out of our churches meant a lack of connection to our community. As uh, although everyone did the best that they could through, like you said, online masses and things like that. But that you know, obviously, with the five kilometer uh, limit. As well, we couldn't go and visit other parishioners, friends, you know, even we couldn't even come and see you, things like that. Yeah, uh, we couldn't it was, see you either um, and everyone else. Yeah, yeah. With the household limits. Yeah. Yeah. So what he was talking about is how we were all, uh, we were squashed down into our homes, basically. Um, and the only time, and he says, the only time we could reveal our faces, our true selves was in our, ha- in our households, because anytime you were out, you were wearing a mask. So as a portrait of exile, where that's a very familiar thing to us, but also not just exile, but also the portrait of a household church. We, you know, we took this on uh, all of us as Catholics in Melbourne, and that's what our as, that's what we became. Our 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 homes became our churches. It's our places of worship. Exactly. So yeah. so we were very much an early church situation in, in that yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, we had our own um, prayer prayer um, tables, and of course, uh, uh, of course, we had our candles and. Uh, cro- uh, crucifix I was about to say crosses but it's crucifix um, yeah just a place where we can just pray and um, you know you know Lindsay it's the church isn't a building I believe the church is a people within the building that's us if us you and I everyone who goes to mass that is the church and it is, it's, you must have been no listening one... to the Archbishop's speech. <laughs> oh well, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Tried, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that too. And no, very heard, true. I've heard it. I've heard it so many times. And and and, and as people think, oh, you going to church, and they're going, uh, what the? You know, when I say the church, what do you mean? It. I'm going to mass, but the church is me. It's Lindsay. It's Caroline. Everyone who goes to goes to our goes to a, go to mass, that is the church. And I'm going, yes, I'm going to church. I'm not going to a building. I'm going to see um, with, people, with people and also praising and going through my sacraments with God and Jesus in, 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 within that. Yep. Yeah, a, an empty building doesn't make a church, does it? Exactly. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Understand? Yep. yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, he said, uh, in our homes, and this is you've already hinted at this, we rediscovered the living bread of God's love for each person and the call to serve one another. He said, each of us is anointed um, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to offer words of healing and reconciliation, gestures of blessing, to teach the faith and grow disciples, to feed the body and the soul. And can I say that just with some of that, I remember during some of the bigger feast days of um, of the year when we couldn't go. So, for example, Ash Wednesday. Yeah. Um, mm. No, Ash Wednesday, we went in lockdown. Oh, we so, lo- yeah, my, uh, sorry, so my yeah. family, my family missed Ash Wednesday for different reasons because my son was in hospital at the time. Oh my so, gosh! Yeah. Yes, that's so right, we had dude. our taste yeah. of that. But um, yeah, but I remember Ash Wednesday. I'd um, uh, we used um some blessed ashes at my school for um, nice. for our Ash Wednesday service, and I asked permission to take a bowl home, and I um shared the blessing with my family with the ashes. Nice. We we you know, ashed each other and had a service at home. Um, but then during Easter, we had you know we did Easter services at home. Palm Sunday, all those kinds of things. We had did, did little things to reflect on those. It might be driveway prayers. It might be setting up, um, as you talked about, setting up something, you know, in a home altar, things like that. Um, symbols, you know, so that um, not not just the adults, but also the children see the significance of what that particular fe- feast day might be. Exactly, exactly. Because we put palm palms on front yes. of our doorways, the front uh, doors. I, that's right. Yes, that's yeah. it. That's it. Nice. Yep. yep. We Here did we that. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Other way. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, and you just hinted at this already, but he, um, but Archbishop Comensoli said, uh, you know, what is the image of a parish then? Yeah. So, what should we see as the image of parish? He said the image comes from what we've just seen there in in those old examples of those the, of the earlier church. He said the um, what would be the image of a parish church in Melbourne? He said that these examples he cited. Um, are incarnational, not territorial. So you exactly. just talked about the buildings, right? Now we're not saying that 
the church buildings are not important. Please don't exactly. misinterpret yeah, no, us. No, no, of don't, course, no. they're important. They're they our, are, you know, they are, they're our meeting yeah. place. They're our, yes. our place of worship. They're sacred. You know, when you walk into a church, you are, you know, you're walking into the presence of God in a very different way. You know, when the mass starts, you're in, you're in, you know, you're celebrating in heaven as, as opposed to just being any, you know, anywhere like geographically. So I'll, I'll just, just so no one, um, you know, gets the idea that we're saying church buildings bad or anything like that. Um, <laughs> no, definitely yeah. not. No, no. But, um, I, yep. yep. Yeah, but the point is, you know, uh, the, our, the image of a parish should be incarnational. It has a body, it has a face. It's not necessarily a building in a certain location. And he said it's to this image of a parish that our local church in Melbourne will need to look if we are to build a family and neighbourhood of communities of grace and of gospel energy that go out beyond territorial boundaries. So look at this. He's, he, he's actually saying, we, you know, we need to build this incarnational face-to-face um, you know, handshake, <laughs> sign of peace yeah. kind of church um, where grace is built, grace upon God's grace is given avenues to work um, through through what we do as well. And he talks about gospel energy. So not just a static gospel, but one that's moving, uh, one that's doing things. And that's, you know, us doing the good, the work of the good news. Uh, that, and he says here, and it's really important to go out beyond territorial boundaries. So re- really, and he's going to say more about this later on, but the laity, um, pushing itself beyond just the the four walls of its church and actually doing outreach. And he'll, he'll give some examples of that later, which we'll go through as well. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Lino, before our podcast, you said that you liked this list, and I like this as well. He said, Pope Francis has been bold enough to pose four key questions that we might ask of our local parish. Local is parishes, it, yeah. Yep. He says, is it in contact with the homes and the lives of its people? That's one of them, yep. Yep. Is it an environment for hearing God's word, for growth in the Christian life, for dialogue, proclamation, charitable outreach, worship, and celebration? That's question two. The third question he cites is, does it encourage and train its members to be evangelizers? And the fourth one is, and is it a sanctuary where the thirsty come to drink in the midst of their journey and a center of constant missionary outreach? Lena, do you want to, any, any reactions to any of those, to those points? Because I, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I have some oh. things to say about them, but what are your thoughts? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, those points are awesome. Um, I understand where um, Pope Francis is going with those questions. And I think the, the first word that comes with it is evangelizing and, and reaching out. Evangelize and reach out. Those are the two words I can see from these uh, questions. And I think we need to, to do that, and I think um, was it Archbishop Peter Comensoli was saying something about the church. Uh, it's it's I don't say it's 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 stagnant. Is he trying to say that? I don't know if he's saying it's stagnant, stagnant, but he's. I think he's trying to give us a bit of a buzz, a jolt. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, he's trying it's to... that. Yeah, we're emerging out of exile, or we're re-emerging. Um, and what do we do now? Yeah, exactly. And I think um, that the ones with. Um, there's questions from the Pope Francis who was saying this man well for for the, for us inside to go out and to evangelize more, more more. I think that's what he's trying to mostly tell us about it, and I think that's what we need. I, even though we have been in lockdown, now we've been in lockdown, and like I said, in exile, it's time for us to come out of exile and to move more, move more. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I think in a way what he's saying is let's set an agenda as well. Interestingly, and I actually really I – was, I was thinking this as he was saying it, um, and then he actually said it because I was thinking wouldn't it be great if we actually you – know, like this is a framework into, like for our parish. What, what if um, – I'm not saying Holy Family doesn't do this, right? But, but what, if, what if we could use these questions as a way to measure what we, what we are doing? Because I always think that, all right, you can say I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, but I always think – how can we do it better? How can we do more? And how can we bring more people on board? Like, it's not enough to tick the box and say, yeah, oh, yeah, we do that. Yeah, that's all right. We do some of that. It's not too bad. Um, and Archbishop Commonsoli then said it. Like he said, wouldn't it be interesting if these were the only agenda items for every parish council meeting? Parish council plenary, meeting, yes. Yeah, yes, or even yes, the plenary council. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm thinking, gosh, mm-hmm. I would. I actually want to throw these <laughs> questions to, to Father Michael and say, look, this is what, you know, this is what the Archbishop said. Can we, can we actually look at these questions? Um, and, uh, you know, and, and discuss this as a parish council, uh, you know, so, and, and see where we stand that's, and maybe this it. can inform yeah. our next ministry, our next outreach work, you know, it can re, re, um, 
yeah, as we come out of, you know, again, as we, as we start to reemerge out of this exile that he was talking about. Um, I think it's a, I think it was a great comment. I know that, you know, some people like giggle because, you know, parish councils and there's the image of parish councils and the way they are. And, I know. You know, I, you know there's the cliche, honest, you know, yeah, yeah, the places of, yeah. you know, battle and argument and things like that. That might be true in some places, but um, I think this is a, I don't think anyone on a parish council could disagree with this list is what I'm trying to say. If we're if we're really putting our money where our mouth is in terms of the gospel and the good news and and the purpose of a parish, then maybe it is this is a good framework. Not a good framework. This is an excellent framework. Excellent framework. Um, it's a provocative framework. It's a challenging framework, and we probably need to measure ourselves against it and face the truth, whatever that truth might be. Um, we are doing enough. We're not doing enough. We can do more. We can do it better. Ask those questions. I think that kind of honesty is liberating. Mm-hmm. Um, Yep. So I think that'd be good. So he then gives an example, and I'm going to actually read this example of um, of the uh, the archdiocese of Miao. Okay. So bear with me on this while I read this story. Um, so he says. So he asks those four questions, and he says, "Is it even possible? All right. Is this possible? These these four questions. Could we ask ourselves these questions and measure ourselves against them and have success?" Um, And that's me putting words into his mouth, that last part. (laughs) um, He says the following. I heard recently of the Diocese of Miao, located in the mountainous northeast of India, on the border with China. Because of its location and the political sensitivities of the region, this has been a diocese in lockdown for more than 40 years. 40 years. The total extent, 40 years. Yeah, not because of COVID, because of political sensitivities and and all all the issues that come with that. Exactly. He says the total extent of the resources available to the bishop when he first arrived was himself and a lay missionary. So there were just the two, a team of two. There was no parish church, no house to live in, and no existing Christian community. Today, 40 years later, the diocese has, has over 90,000 baptized Catholics, Woo. which is 20% wow. of the total 20%. population. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Ooh. So what was the secret? What, what was the bishop's secret source here? Okay. The, the bishop, again, yeah, I'm putting words source. in there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Secret um, source. But the Bishop of Miao um, identified three factors for this extraordinary growth in Christian life. The intentional transmission of faith within family homes. Hint, hint. That's what we were just talking about before. The regular gathering of neighbors in small communities of prayer, formation, and fellowship. <laughs> parish. Okay. And the charitable <laughs> and social outreach to those in, the, in need. Again, <laughs> parish. Okay. Um, armed only with the grace of baptism and an apostolic confidence, they have simply done what was asked of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Wow. <laughs> we, we can't complain that we're ill-equipped or that we're not ready. Uh, the, uh, so now he says the following, because the next thing we would say is, um, but that's not us. We're not that. You know, we're not the Archdiocese of, of Miao. How do we, what does that mean? But he says the following. Um, he said, while the Archdiocese of Melbourne is a different place with a different context, and again, this is my word, sorry, we can ask the same questions of discipleship. And these are his words. Have we responded to God's word and are we walking in God's presence? Have we responded, sorry, have we shared the company of our brothers and sisters and joined with them in prayer and fellowship? Have we advanced in a life of love and service of others? And he said, these are the questions asked of sponsors, of the sponsors of catechumens at their right of election, the questions that define a disciple of Jesus Christ. So right of election is when um, people, they're called catechumens, they have been going through the journey of RCIA to become Catholics, so that they're probably, they're adults usually, um, so that they, they weren't baptized as children, so they're adults who are becoming Catholic. And so they take on the journey and it can take months, it can take a year, it can take years, several years. Uh, and they'll be baptized at Easter. So you know how we've had adults baptized at Easter in our parish. So this is basically um, the rite of election is the time uh, near the sort of uh, during Lent, hang on, or just before. Okay, I'm going to be wrong about this completely. I'll have to get corrected later. But um, they will go to, um, in, in Melbourne anyway, they go to the cathedral and there's a ritual of election where they are, their names are literally read from a book. <laughs> All right. Um, their names, yeah, there's, there's symbolism there to say that they are just about about to complete their journey to Christ through nice. the sacraments. So they'll receive their baptism, their first Holy Communion, their confirmation. So Yeah, so they're basically in. Um, yeah, but he's saying here that the the sponsor, so that they have a sponsor just like how um, children who, um, or even adults who um, receive their confirmations, they have a sponsor. So they have a, a sponsor with a similar role. But the questions again that are asked the sponsors, he said, these define a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
And again, these are, have we responded to God's word? And I'll be walking in God's presence. So that's, you know, not criteria number one, but certainly question number one to, to think very carefully about. Have we shared the company of our brothers and sisters and joined them in prayer and fellowship? That's discipleship point number two. And have we advanced in a life of love and service of others? So we have prayer, fellowship, and service as the hallmarks of discipleship. So, uh, you know, God is the center of all that. And, and from God flowing out from us is our service to others, is our prayer with others, is our fellowship with others. So can, a, can all of these, uh, can all of, all of us who are baptized and call ourselves disciples of Christ enact and take this on as our, um, as our mission in our parishes, responding to God's word, walking with God? sharing the company of our brothers and sisters and joining them in prayer and fellowship um, and serving others, the life of love and service of others. So there's, a, there's some really important questions there for us to consider. Uh, so I talked about before going to the parish council and saying, are we doing these things? But these questions are, am I doing these things? This is very, a very personal thing to think about and possibly something you can, sh- you know, questions to ask um, of each other, you know, to, to talk about where we think we are and maybe a spiritual director for a person who needs that, that deeper direction as well about exactly. questions like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What do you think? Challenging questions? Oh, definitely for, for, for many people, hey, especially for myself, you know, even though I'm <laughs> spiritually, but I, I do need a bit of a, a boost to my spirituality a bit more and um, to be more a, a disciple in, in a sense too. So yeah, wow, man, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, wow. but it's, I mean, yeah. in a sense, it's great that the Archbishop has said all this because now we're having this conversation and now we're sharing this conversation with others who will hopefully think about it for themselves, all, all of you exactly. who are listening today. Um, and we'll hopefully share it with others too. So, and again, you can be in the Archdiocese of Melbourne, but you don't have to be because this for me, I, get, I think is a universal message for every parish around the entire world. Um, even though the context might be different, the, the questions about are we being disciples is our parish doing discipleship and um, you know in an authentic way that follows Christ? These are important things for us to think about. So I I really like this uh, this next paragraph or these next two parts. There's some challenges from that are going on here, right? But I'll just read the this. Uh, I might read the first one and then we'll, we'll talk about it. But he said this. He said we can tend to think that the biggest questions in our church are about a shortage of priests and religious, or a lack of lay governance or not enough resources, or a weakening of Catholic schooling, or a disassociation of young people. If only we can solve these, we ask, then all will be well. But really, as a brother bishop has put it rather bluntly, the greatest challenge faced by the church today is a loss in confidence in Jesus Christ. And I bolded that last sentence. Yeah. Uh, because this for me, like, if you saw me nodding in the video, like you said, Lino, there, I was nodding. I was like, hey, hey, hey. I was like nodding 100%. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, that, that list of you know, I'm going to say complaints because that's what they sound like when I hear people say them. Oh, we have a shortage of priests. Oh, we don't have enough lay governance. Oh, we don't have enough resources. Oh, Catholic schools are weak. Oh, we don't talk to young people. I, I feel like I've been hearing this my entire life, even I, as a, as a child. It does sound like the man. I yeah. feel like this list has Every, just been repeated yeah. again and again. It's like, and for me, it's like chewing chewing gum for 30 years. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Yeah, sure. It sounds like a list that we can all get, you know, a bit rowdy and crazy and passionate about. But it's the but we complain about. I don't want to. I don't want to criticize people either who have who say these things. All right. But the thing is, if we just keep looking at these things, then I don't know if we're really looking where we need to look. And and, and look at what he says. He says, "Well, what about this? What if it's just that there's a loss of confidence in Jesus Christ?" And I actually want to question the Archbishop about this because I want to clarify more because my interpretation is, and I'll read the next paragraph to, to say, to talk about why I think this is, and then I'll, I'll talk about my interpretation of it. He said, we need to face into this perhaps, uh, we need to face into this perhaps uncomfortable truth. As I read recently, we are built for a church that no longer exists yeah. and we have an infrastructure for a church that no longer exists. And Pope Francis has been quite explicit about calling on local churches not to struggle to hold on to what is left behind, but to see itself as a mission church moving outward. This is going to re- require a renewal of the lay apostolic life. Here is what I think, what I'm interpreting, the, uh, the loss of confidence in Jesus Christ is. It's that society no longer sees the church as um, a central part of the discussion. At least in Melbourne, we can say that the church has been pushed to the, to the, to the edges. Yeah, um, the, the institutional church, at least. And, 
I'm not going to, again, this isn't some kind of criticism about, oh, look, the church is not being listened to anymore. I'm not, I'm not getting into the now. But the point I'm trying to get at is that society itself, I mean, there was a time when there were more Catholics and more people had confidence in Christ and what Christ will do for their lives. Now there's much less. So Christ has been uh, watered down to not as important as anyone else. Exactly. Um, mm. He's just a, just a figure um, similar to any other important inspirational figure that we might think of, but he's not really the God of our lives who transforms us, who feeds us, who is going to bring us to himself, who incarnated and walked among us in solidarity, dot, 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 all the theology. So there's a loss exactly. of confidence in that, though. There's a loss of confidence in, in the salvation that, that he offers um, in the sense that people maybe don't see, as, see it as an important thing anymore. Um, and so that seems to be the, the, the biggest, um, uh, what do I call it? The, the larger sickness rather than things like the symptoms that people are talking about, like lack of lay governance, you know, uh, shortage of priests, etc. So what, uh, and so what he said here in that last sentence of that second paragraph, this is going to require a renewal of the lay apostolic life. So, and obviously this isn't lay versus bishops or lay versus priests. I don't like getting into that discussion. I find it very nauseating to be honest, but what I, I find really what, because now who did Archbishop Common Soli invite to this, this dinner on Wednesday night? Everyone. Not just, yeah, from, not just not priests. Not just for Catholics. But, you know, yep. uh, everyone. Of, of right? everyone. Lay Catholics from across the board. Even exactly. us, you know. Even us from our little podcast, the you know, the <laughs> yes. you know what I mean? Yes, uh, yes, right? yes. Because there's there's an apostolic outreach that he thinks that we are all capable of, uh, you know, of um of perpetuating, of growing, of reaching out. Exactly. Um, and so I think um, I think, you know, I think he's right on the money. All right, we are uh, because we need to stop lamenting over the way that we did church and how that's changing, and look at how we must do church. Um, and when I say church, I mean being the body of Christ, being being apostles of Christ. How must we do this um, this apostolic life, this this life of discipleship, going into the future? Because uh, because let's think about it. There have been very very successful programs and things over over time that have done lots of things for evangelization, but it's not sustainable to say it worked then; it should work now because people change, the world changes. We need to speak as apostles to the word to the world as it is now, not as it was 10, it was 20, 10 30 20 years, years ago. ago. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so he goes on to say this, he says, baptism or calling of the laity is to be 11 in the world. And it strikes me at, it strikes me as deeply as a deeply important sense and in need of being reclaimed. The call to renewal of parish life is also a call to renewal in the social fabric of contemporary Victoria, Victorian and Australian life. It is the laity who are the ones to be sent as instruments of apostolic grace to work for the transformation of the world from within. And the, I guess the from within means in our context where we are, where, you know, we, where we work, where we, where we meet people, where we go out, where, where we, who we have barbecues with. Barbecues you know, with can, yeah. <laughs> can we be disciples? Now, I'm not saying, you know, in the middle of a family barbecue, pull out a Bible and say, the Lord says, you know. Like, you know. Oh, but, wow. Um, oh, but wow. However, that'll be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But however, the thing is, um, if people know who we are and what we're about, then they should be meeting the gospel of Jesus Christ through our discipleship and go back to the list of what it means to be a disciple, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So that's what people should be encountering when they encounter us. And this isn't a, again, this isn't a criticism. This isn't a lament. This isn't a, a put down because I have to work on this. Lino, you know, you have to work on oh, this. Definitely. Everyone yeah. who's listening knows that they have to work on this constantly, constantly all the time. Um, and each of us would, would be called into a, a way of doing lay ministry in different kinds of ways. Um, it may not be, be, it may not even be being part of a formal ministry. It might just be being your everyday self as a, as a disciple of Jesus Christ as well. Exactly. So mm -hmm. yeah. So um, he went on to talk about some examples of Catholics from the past, and I'm just gonna just excuse me while I scroll down. So he said, um, just bear with me. There's a bit of reading to do here, Lino. So just bear with me. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> so he said, um, Mary Glau. Uh, so over the years, the local church in Melbourne has been blessed with so many outstanding lay apostles. They stand with us as saints among the saints of our own local church. I would like to mention four such men and women. His first example is Mary Glowry. She was one of the first women to study medicine at Melbourne University and a founding member of the Catholic Women's Social Guild in 1916, now known as the Catholic Women's League. 
who was whose work sought to bring about change in world affairs through prayer and action. Her cause for sainthood is already underway. May it accelerate. May it, may it happen. That'd be awesome. Hey, Elaine, um, can I ask you a yeah. question? Uh, yeah. What? Uh, how? What is the process of a person being be, becoming a saint? Long. Uh, Oh, Sometimes that's a bit, expensive, very, very long. Lots oh, of work, okay. lots of research. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, okay. this is something mm-hmm. we might have to do an episode on. But essentially, <laughs> yeah. the, the bare bones of it is that um, a diocese would make a would make a submission to to Rome. Um, they would have to pay lots of money for it because they have to pay for the the research, the work, the people who are going to do undertake the the investigations and everything. That okay. person's life okay. is investigated for a long, 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 long time. Wow. Um, wow. They, first, okay. they are. Um, Oh, not canonized. There's another word. They're, they're beatified. So beatified means they're blessed. So for example, Mary McKillop, our first Australian saint, she was beatified long before she was canonized. So as, as a beatified saint, she could be a saint for the country that she came from. So she was an Australian saint long before she was canonized by Pope Benedict the 16th. Um, and then she was officially canonized for the universal church as well, which was a wonderful day for all of us. Um, yeah. Anyway, we can get into that in another episode. Oh, sorry, 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 no, no, that's, right. <laughs> that's, that's the bare bones of it, and I, yes, you know, yes. I'm I'm not doing it justice, but that yeah, um, but yeah, there's more to it, yeah, than that. Um, but yeah, so that's why people aren't aren't canonized, you know, left, right, and center. Oh well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the church has to be sure as well. Uh, they invest, you know, they've got to invest it. They have to be sure that the person that they're that they're canonizing. Um, you know, fits the criteria of a saint, uh, well, of a person in, in heaven, essentially, anyway. Um, yeah, so that's uh, Mary Glowry, the, the first example. Another example he cites is B.A. Santa Maria, or Bob Santa Maria. He was a young journalist and political activist when he co-founded the Catholic Worker newspaper in 1936. At its height, it sold 70,000 copies a week. Deeply, influential by the, deeply influenced by the social teaching of the Catholic Church, Bob, a family man at heart, was a leading figure in economics, politics, and social activism throughout his life. I feel like we should do an episode on some of these people in the near future as well. Just well, uh, yeah, going to a bit because cool. we haven't got time to go into the detail about them now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah the next ones and, and um, influential on a lot of our lives, I think, in some ways, were Evelyn and John Billings. They were a married couple. They were physicians. I didn't actually, ignorantly, I didn't realize they were from Melbourne, so I feel really bad about that. Oh, <laughs> I'd no, heard their names okay. before, yeah, but they were. Um, physicians and scientists who pioneered the, in the 1950s the natural fertility treatments for couples that would allow for responsible family planning in harmony with church teaching. Known as the Billings Ovulation Method, it was recognized by the World Health Organization and is now practiced across the world. Now, it's interesting because uh, I remember seeing, um, there's been some newspaper articles recently about apps that actually do this now too. Oh, yeah. So, oh wow. Yeah. Okay. So cool. um, the whole charting of fertility, even for secular reasons of trying to, like trying to have children, whatever. So um, the, again, this is a science segment for Caroline to do, not for me because <laughs> I'll get it completely wrong. However, um, what is it? The, uh, it is, you know, it's, it's an important method of, of basically of helping a woman understand her body and what it's doing, at, you know, um, at different times in the month. And again, I'm not an expert on this, but, um, but, you know, this, uh, I think, is an empowering thing for women who, um, who have used it successfully as well. But uh, again, future episode, hopefully we'll do something on the science of that later on. Um, but what's he saying about these four people, these, these men and women? He said, Mary, Bob, Evelyn and John were all members of our local church. Hint, hint to what he was saying before. It was here among our own families and in our own neighborhoods. This is exactly how we started his speech, by the way, that they were formed in faith at home gathered in hope with their neighbors and went out in love to our own society. So he's holding them up as models for discipleship. They grew up in Catholic homes. They did all the, all the Catholic things in their homes. They had a parish life. They connected with others. Clearly they had a prayer life. And then they went and did things to reach out to others in society. So they became the gospel for, for wider society as well in different ways. But, uh, and he says, all right, but what about now? Uh, what about today? Where are the Glowries, the Santa Maria's, and the billings of our time. Uh, and this is where uh, I got a bit teary. Oh, Lids. For, for reasons that I'm going to explain in a moment. Okay, all right? Lids. All right. Okay. But first okay. of all, um, and, uh, first of all, he said, well, with us in this evening, with us this evening is a group of parishioners who have used the distressing closure of the Flemington Towers last year to grow a mission to the struggling families in their neighborhood. So this was, do you remember when the, the, um, the housing towers in, in Flemington, they were put under lockdown and yeah. these are the most these are some of the most vulnerable people in in our society in Victoria yeah. 
those towers, uh, poor migrants, uh, you know, all kinds of say, social issues. Who yeah. lives in those? Yeah, it's poor um, migrants. Yeah. And, yeah, and COVID yeah. was spreading through these towers and they got locked down, which is the worst thing. It's the last yeah. thing these people need. And um, I remember donating money to a food bank to support because I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stand the thought that I could, even though I was locked down in my own home, I couldn't stand the thought that they were being asked to do this. They couldn't even get out. You know, they couldn't even go outside. It was so... So awful. So it was so heartwarming to see there were all kinds of groups that reached out, um, di- different faith groups, um, you know, different people. But amongst them were, and I didn't actually know this, uh, is a group of parishioners who used that time to grow a mission to the struggling families in their neighborhoods. So absolutely amazing. Also with us is a, uh, he said, uh, is a Catholic high, uh, sorry, I'll try it again, is a Catholic high school teacher who, with others, is developing a new educational framework in liberal arts for piloting in 2022. And as a teacher, I, I very much would like to have a look at that at some stage. I was stage about to say, when he said yeah. that, I thought, is that Lindsay? No, 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 no. It's not me. No, no, no. no, 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 no I'm not that good. Which is, oh, arts. And yeah. I go, is arts? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. No, no. Uh, I'm still trying to make sure my kids can write decent essays, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he said, Among Us is someone who leads an organization that supports at-risk mothers and mothers-to-be to keep their children. So, it's like, see how we're saying, look, here are the modern, uh, you know, Glowry, Santa Maria's, yeah, Billings's, exactly. you know, they're all here. And this is where I got a bit teary and I had to kind of hide it from everyone else. <laughs> because oh, because oh, wow. we weren't expecting this and we were so humbled. He said, there is someone here who, with a couple of friends, produces a weekly, it's actually fortnight, let's just clarify, but produces a podcast discussing faith, science, and life. I'm like, that's us. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know what I mean? And not, it, it's not the... It's not the idea that we got a shout out, which exactly, which was no. amazing. It, it's that I was. It's just tears of humility. It's like the the weight of discipleship that's been ugh, not the burden, but like the like the trust, I guess, that yeah, the Archbishop true, of our diocese has put yes. has put in us. You know, these again everyday Catholics who are just trying to live their lives and and share something through a podcast every fortnight. Um, for him to give us that acknowledgement, I I think you know this was a. This wasn't for me. This was for all of us, and this was for anyone who listens as well. Um, it's for it's for the SQPN, you know, network. It's for everyone who's who's um given us the trust to carry the gospel in the way that we try and do through talking about faith, talking about science, talking about culture, it's about life issues, talking about fun oh. things, yeah, entertainment. So um, uh, oh wow, I just I just felt like we were part of the church. I mean, we we already are part of the church, but I felt yeah. like we were. Connected to the mission of everyone else. Yeah, I wow, man, I'm just feeling uh, little butterflies in my what is it, stomach or heart. I don't know which one yeah. it is. It's Both. just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like, I'm not saying that. Oh, what can I say? We're, we're amongst those people who who have helped other people. The people who helped the people in the Flemington department. I mean, um, apartments, and um, the people who have helped um, people who who are trying to our uh, parents. Sorry couples who are trying to well pregnant and everything we're, we're amongst those people like uh, it's it's a great honor man it's a uh, uh yeah i feel so humbled you know we're, we're just like through three you um three amigos and of course jerry's still jerry's still included in here yes uh, absolutely and, yeah and you know we we're just doing our, our disciple duty and enjoying it and um reaching out and you know i want to go thank sqp and for it so everything for them, they've done. Like I just did a speech there. I'm going to be in trouble by then. I feel like I'm doing like a, like a Grammy Award speech there. Sorry, we're but, kind of down editing. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I'm yeah, kidding. No, it's, no, it's beautiful. Yeah, so no. humble, man. Yeah. I was like, whoa, whoa. Okay, whoa. Yeah. Um, I did say a short thank you to the Archbishop on our behalf at the at the cool. end of the night as well awesome. before I went home. But um, yeah, it, not it's not because he called us out. It's because... Again, he just feeling like we're part of the mission of the church. We already were. We already knew we were. But yeah, but yeah, to yeah. but to say, look here, th- this is also how we do mission. This is how we do discipleship. Um, and yeah, so we're all grateful. I know Caroline was really grateful too. She can't, you know, she can't be with us today. But I told her all about it. And she was very excited. Um, yeah, and so he went on to say, but also with us as well. So um, with all those groups that I mentioned, also with us are some people who began a nightly rosary on Zoom during lockdown, gathering nice. dozens of family in prayer uh, every single evening. I know that um, some youth groups are meeting on Zoom as well. Too. Oh, They're awesome. Like, yeah, um, my son, uh, he went to one youth group meeting night with um, a local parish down the road here just in Nary Warren. 
Um, and they had a night where they were on Zoom and they were playing games, like they were playing Pictionary and doing all these fun things. And then they had a guest speaker. You know, it was, really, it was a really good oh, night. Oh, cool. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah, so that, um, yeah, so it's it's good to see those ministries reaching out, and I think what will happen is that people will, you know, there the seeds of discipleship were probably planted by, um, you know, by this lockdown or or you know the leaven as he was talking about, you know, people making bread, and let's just see what rises out of it, I guess, and that's what uh, that's probably what he's hoping to see, exactly. Um, mm. And he said this, but uh, but all of us here uh, are making contributions to the lives and needs of those who live in Melbourne. While I while I speak to you today from a heart from the heart of the Christian gospels, each of us are called to live our lives for the good of each other, a life of holiness that witnesses to more human, a more human way of living in our society. A domestic priestly life is yours to claim by the grace of baptism and yours to live as a leaven, um, as a mother doe that brings life to others. Let me finish then with some prophetic words of Pope Francis, naming the call of every household of faith in our extraordinary city. The saints of all uh, of our own household churches, along with our patron saint Patrick, you have to let go of the edges of exist. Sorry, I'll try that again. You have to go to the edges of existence if you want to see the world as it is. You have to make for the margins and f- to find a new future. And that's from um, from Pope Francis's Let Us Dream, which I still need to read. So I will do that. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so that was we've now I've. Uh, I've only gone through sections of the speech and I, I strongly recommend anyone um, who would like to read it or would like to, to view it. Yeah. We'll put a link to that in our show notes from the Melbourne Catholic, um, which is an online publication for the Archdiocese of Melbourne. Uh, and you're welcome to use it for your reflection during Lent. It's a great time before we get to Easter and the, and the resurrection of Christ. It's a good time to sit down maybe during Holy Week um, and have a read uh, or have a watch and, and come up with your own thoughts about it too. Lena, do you have any final thoughts about the speech before we move on? Yeah, I was, yeah, this is my third time. I I listened to it on that Wednesday. Was it Thursday, Lena? It, it was uh, Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday night. It happened. Yeah. And yeah. I, I watched it on Thursday. I watched it again yesterday, and I watched it this morning just to mm. get get some points and and what we was talking about. So yeah, the part about exile, the part part about our parishes. Um, I was. He's not trying to say moving forward. It's more, you know, reaching out more, you know, and then and there are other ways to to evangelize as well, you know. It's not just uh, just just a normal department of the places we're there. We've got this other way to do it too. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, he's awesome, and also also I just recognize he he shaved. So I was like, oh, he's so different <laughs> now. Yeah. Oh man, that looks yes. so cool. Yeah, yeah, we are. All right. So Archbishop Coventsoli, if you're listening, we have talked about your lockdown beard a couple of times. We liked it. We liked it. All right. We did like it. But we've, uh, yeah, we've, we, big, not because of you only, but because there, we saw lots of prominent public figures growing lockdown beards. Um, I couldn't grow a beard because I wasn't allowed to, but um, that's a different issue altogether. <laughs> but yeah. it was, yeah, the speech was very, very well yeah. done. And, yes. You know, that's where we went later. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I agree as well. It was, um, it was inspiring in one sense to to hear the Archbishop of our diocese call, making that that call, you know, yes. calling laity to um to think more about parish life and to think about their discipleship, um the partnership with the greater church of you know of Melbourne and and the work that we can do in our city in our in our metro Melbourne area in our country areas um oh, to definitely. think more about it um, yeah, and how we can be you know the good news disciples of Christ um and, and also i guess how we can get out of the way and let Christ do his his thing as well oh yeah maybe there's yeah. there's some of that to think about too mm-hmm. Definitely. um yeah so that's uh that's where we'll leave discussing we well we've almost an hour so <laughs> we've yeah, well, uh, so almost long. three times longer than uh, his speech talking yeah. about it <laughs> uh, i hope we've done it some justice anyway i hope we have um we've we've uh, done that and i hope we've inspired all who are listening to uh to have a, a look at it in the show notes and and look at it especially especially if you're in Melbourne, to pass it on to your parishes. If you're a parish council person, take it in. Uh, talk, talk to your parish priest about it. Or if you're a member of the laity, pass it on to your parish priest. Or if you know someone in the parish council, pass it to your fellow parishioners. You'll f- share it around with fellow Catholics. I, I think um, it'd be great if, uh, you know, to a poor choice of words, it'd be great if this went viral. Of all the things that go viral on the internet, it'd be great if this went viral amongst Catholic circles so we could start not start, but so we can continue to fire up our engines and really get that gospel energy that he mentioned going again. Exactly, exactly. All right. Uh, why don't we move on, Lino, then? Um, and we're going to have a very short wow. discussion <laughs> uh, about entertainment. <laughs> I don't know. Where are you get your delusions, laser brain? Oh, 
not what we came here to do. No, but it's what I'm going to do. I have a plan. You've got a plan. I have part of a plan. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? All right, Lino. So let's uh, let's have a quick discussion. Um, what have you been watching, Lino? What, what's been uh, what, what's um, been entertaining you? Watching or reading anything lately? Uh, so far, we're, we're still watching um, Star Trek: The Original Series. Are you we're back then, into that now? Yeah, we're back into that. We're, we're, we're going from that to watching Superstore, that we which oh, we yes. talked Mentioned about that, last yep. um, uh, episode. And then I watched only like ten minutes of it. it was I think you've been um, you mentioned this one called The Expanse. So I only watched oh, 10 minutes of it. But yes. I, I, I I know that there's different factions, not factions, but I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. And then a guy at work told me, he goes, it's almost like Game of Thrones. And, oh, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. And I go, well, it is? He goes, yeah, you got a lot of different factions in this other, under, in the belt. Well, yeah, so, I guess you could say that in a way. Yeah. 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 There, there's some, I guess there's some similarity. Um, no, not yeah. too much similarity, thank goodness. But um, yeah, you know yeah. What I thankfully, mean. Thankfully, there isn't all the all yeah. the junk that you have to watch to get through it. There's exactly, yeah. exactly. Because I know there's three. There's there's Earth, of course, for us. There's Mars, and then you got the belt. The belt, and, yeah. And he told me the belt has like different factions in the belt. Yeah, and I went, wow, okay. So even though I've only watched ten minutes, ten minutes <laughs> of it, it it looks promising. It looks promising. It looks pretty cool. But yeah, I. I can't I can't get into it yet, but I'm I'm so I'm, I'm trying not to start too many shows. So <laughs> what we're trying to do is we're trying to finish the first season of Superstore, then come back and watch um Brooklyn Nine Nine, because Brooklyn Nine Nine's got their last. It could be last season. I you know how they do it. They go, oh last season. All of a sudden, it's like John Farnham. They're back again and do it again. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, <laughs> John we'll go Farnham, back. You brought that in. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, I'm back again. Yeah. So oh, right. well, after the first, after the. The first, like after that season, we finish with Superstore. We'll go back and finish off um, Brooklyn Nine Nine. But um, books, oh my gosh, you, you wouldn't believe it, Liz. I'm still reading Game of Thrones, but it's yeah, it is. It's good, but he, I just need like almost like ten, fifteen, twenty minutes to sit down, just concentrating. It's it's so many characters, yes. so many things happening, and I'm complex. Think, yeah, yeah, and I've I think I've said it on the podcast or you guys said. Uh, I should have read the books before watching the show because the books, and I've said this before, they sh- they tell you more in depth in what's going uh, on. Hey, the, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think, and I, look, I only read the first two books and watched the first season. I like actually watching the first season was enough for me. That's like, yeah, to be honest, but yeah, yeah, I understand. I, um, I understand. But, the, uh, but the books do a far, far, far better job of storytelling than the oh, series yeah, does. Definitely. The series, uh, I've said it before, it's well acted, well produced, it's it's compelling. But it's, the thing is, I just yeah. like why do I have to watch all that, you know, to to enjoy yeah, the story? You know what exactly. I mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean, even like let's do a comparison. The Expanse cuts out some of the like like it doesn't have the naughty stuff necessarily that um the Game of Thrones does but it does have isn't it Lindsay yeah Yeah. that's all it's a big yeah it's all based on books as well it does have um it does have violence um again not Game of Thronesy violence but still violence enough that it's not you know it's not an easy watch sometimes um but yeah but the thing is uh Game of Thrones not Game of Thrones sorry um The Expanse for me uh while I wouldn't use it as a morality tale of examples of people that you would want to necessarily say (laughs) these are you know these are people I want to be like um (laughs) It yeah. it does, it does in a way show me a story of um, people who are trying to do good in a in a solar system gone bad, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So True. that the value okay. of human life in a lot of ways is uh, is low. Um, human life seems a little bit disposable in this in the um to, and and again, even it just doesn't matter what faction you belong to. There there are different reasons why in each of these three factions, human life is is disposable, and you've got people who are caught up in the middle of it. Who are trying to be good, but they they struggle. They make a lot of. There's a lot of things that they shouldn't do as well. You know what exactly. I mean? But exactly. Yeah. So in that sense, it, there's something in, in it that I think that's worth um, worth taking. However, um, <laughs> again, I wouldn't use these people as role models for my life. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, because there's um this what is it the two resources which I I believe I I do believe will be the most most looked after resources when we start expanding in space. What is it? Water? And oh, water. W- and what was the other one? Uh, air. 
water, well, I guess so. a yeah. water and oxygen. They were the most. The, the, they were saying it, this is the point we had at the start of it. They said there's the most um, looked, <laughs> try to fight for um, resource you can besides what was it called um, coal and <laughs> gold. Yeah, well, the um, it's, the it's, politics it's, of it is that um, in in one sense, Earth and Mars exactly. uh, they they mine resources in what's called the belt, so like the outer asteroids or the you know whatever you call it, the sort of the asteroid belts, which would be which would have, would have be rich in water and minerals water and all those kinds of things. And, everything. Yeah, and the exactly. belt, the belt who does a lot of that work for mm. Earth and Mars, Earth and Mars don't enjoy the benefits of the work that they're doing. Um, so you've got this kind of attitude uh, that we see on Earth, some in a lot of places here in our own planet, where uh, people are using resources from different places, but the people who are digging up the resources for them don't enjoy the benefits, or the people who are growing the crops, or the people who are making the equipment or whatever it might be. Um, they don't enjoy the benefits of their labor, um, and they're second-class citizens. They are sub. They are treated as subhuman. They're not subhuman, but they're treated in a way as subhuman. As a, yeah. they're a means to an end. Um, yeah, wow. I could go on for ages about this. Oh anyway, no, no, not. no! I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh. Yeah. So I think there's some goodness in in the expanse. Like I said, I think it's the best sci-fi show there is, and sci-fi is meant to challenge us a little bit. Yes, um, it does. You know, challenge our expectations and things like that. It's not just about space battles and. And lightsabers, although well, I love that kind of well, stuff look, too. Well, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely watching the original Star Trek series. There's definitely struggle, not oh, yeah. struggles. Not struggles. There's the challenges of watching that, and you go, "Wow, that's so different." Okay. Yeah, Star Trek gets yeah. very Star Trek. The original series gets very preachy sometimes. You know, how many times has <laughs> Captain Kirk does. pulled out a speech to save the day? It's like, oh no, tell me about like, it, man. It's how like am I going to defeat the baddies? Speech time. <laughs> speech time. And it's, it's, yeah. like, it's not a, it's like a, not a close up. You have like a soapies, but it's like a close yeah. Up. <laughs> yeah. Risk is our game, gentlemen. Anyway, sorry, that's it. Yeah, Captain Kirk. That's a whole other thing. All right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And there's like he's giving this speech, and there's the rousing Star Trek theme in the background. Like you know, by the end they're all like, anyway, that's it. Yeah. Um. All right. So I've got um I've got two to talk about. One I'm going to talk about very briefly because it's too early to uh actually say a lot about it because it's it's brand new. So last night, and this would be a week ago when the podcast comes out, but last night I watched the first episode of uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, very different from WandaVision, obviously different different heroes, different concepts, um, a yeah. lot more. Mm. Well, so very action oriented. However, also um, we're getting a lot more background about these characters. They're filling in the background, which is really good to see. So okay, um, I won't yeah. say too much about it, but um, they they are both, uh how do i put it dealing with being heroes but also having real lives as well which is great i I like that and there's obviously a larger plot going on in the background with it you know that's obviously going to be bigger but um there was a great action sequence early on with um with uh falcon with sam um and i won't say anything but i loved it i was like wow that was really cool you know know." (laughs) obviously we know he flies right so there's going to be lots of flying action true 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 Yeah, Yeah, had a nice Star Wars vibe to it, but I really actually enjoyed it. So um, (laughs) I was impressed with the first episode. Now, these episodes seem to be longer. So this was about 50-ish minutes, I think. Wow, almost an hour. Yeah. uh, So whereas Mm -hmm. WandaVision was kind of like, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes here and there. Uh, But I really enjoyed it. I can't say anything much more about it because I I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. Um, But definitely worth watching. Um, And the other show I wanted to mention very briefly was Interstellar. All right, it's an old movie now, so it's been around for a while. Uh, but the reason why I mention this is because uh, I've I've been using it in my Year Twelve philosophy class. So this is like philosophy, philosophy. lights. Yeah. Wow. So, Interstellar. Um, okay. But this is but this is philosophy lights. This is not like deep philosophy. You know, oh, uh, dig okay. in. Right. This is like a class that meets twice a week, and we do a bit. You know, some interesting stuff. So because we only meet briefly i've got to make it a bit more compelling so we've been <laughs> we've been looking at um the idea of metaphysics you know what's real uh, all that, you know all that kind of stuff wow and we okay. we um we did the the question of um what does philosophy say about the existence of god and also what wow. does philosophy say about the existence of free will like are we really free or is our life determined for all these uh, all this kind of stuff anyway wow yeah i'll okay, get into that same. now However, so I've used Interstellar as an example of those two at play. And, uh, and again, I'm not going to go through a lesson plan for this now. But the reason I'm talking about Interstellar is because I was watching with my class. I hadn't watched it in a while. And I forgot how much I love Interstellar as a movie. So if you okay. haven't seen it, oh, please, if like, anyone hasn't seen it, please go watch it. It's a Who's almost, that doing again? Who plays? Uh, Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, all right, so all right, the, all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 the wild turkey guy, isn't it? Oh, the wild uh, turkey. I and can't uh, yeah. what's her name? Um, 
Oh, I always have a mental oh. blank. She played Catwoman in Batman. Uh, oh. oh, no. I, was, I know which one you're talking about. Um, Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. Ha- Anne Hathaway, yeah. yes, great. Yeah, yeah is yeah, in yeah. it as well. And then some other people. <laughs> oh, Michael Caine <laughs> is in it as well. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, oh, wow. and so cool. is so is John Lithgow. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they're, they're all in it. Yeah, cool, and then cool, some cool, other cool. actors. Oh, Matt Damon is in it too. I forgot Matt Damon. Oh, it's, oh, geez. oh every time I hear, yes. I think when I think of Matt Damon, I think of um, Beautiful Mind. Is that the one he's in? No, that's Jim, uh, Jim Carrey, isn't it? Beautiful no, Mind. No, uh, Beautiful Mind with um, Russell Crowe. Oh, no, not Chris Russell oh, Crowe. Russell Crowe. Um, yeah. No, not Chris oh. Crowe. Oh, I'm getting my name? TV shows, my movies mixed oh, no, up. I'm bad. I'll, <laughs> the I'm Martian. Mixed up he was in The Martian, Matt Damon. Yes, that's yeah. right, Matt Damon. Yep, 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 yep definitely, definitely. Um, yep. Yeah. And of course, the, um, um, the Bourne series. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well and, oh, oh, yes. The Bourne trilogy. Oh, my gosh. I love the first three Bourne movies. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Jason Bourne. So, oh, sorry. Yes. We'll put a sidetrack there. Sorry. Dude. Yeah, like, we'll do that <laughs> in another one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Interstellar, just very quickly. Um, yeah. So the, yeah. the premise is that the Earth is dying. So an extreme, um, you know, environmental issues. So it could be climate change or something. It's never really said, but there's extreme environmental issues. The Earth is is dying. It hasn't been looked after. All right, they didn't they didn't read Laudato C from Pope Francis, obviously. So I looked after <laughs> the Earth and its gifts and and honored the Earth as it should be. Um, and so uh, yeah, food crops are dying. There are only certain foods like corn crops and things like that. Um, kids can't get you know a lot of kids can't really like school is kind of useless because um, the schools decide if they get to do further study or not. And a lot of them are just told they're going to be farmers because farmers is what the Earth needs to make lots of food. All of the above, um, wow. but oh, wow. there is a but there's this mysterious other force at play which is influencing the lives of uh, two of the main characters of um, Matthew McConaughey's uh, Coop or Cooper and his daughter Murph. You know Murphy, and like, there's that famous like scene where he goes Murph. Murph. Anyway, that's <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, their lives are being influenced in some kind of way, um, and it's it's a great film for exploring. Um, the the hand of God in our lives, in a sense. Okay. So, oh, uh, right. you know, there, there's it's it doesn't say that God is responsible for the events, and it does it kind of hints that future humans, in a way, are responsible. But as an analogy of um of the of the possibility of God, um, having the big picture, um, it's it's a really great film for that. There's a speech that Anne Hathaway's character um, Brand that she gives, where she talks about um the mystery of love. And, you know, she's a scientist and, uh, and as a scientist, and she's saying that, uh, that love has a purpose beyond, you know, beyond it, it exists beyond time and space and things like that. And Matthew McConaughey is very skeptical. He goes, no, love, love is utility. Love just means that we don't abandon our children. Love is what keeps people together so the human race can survive and things like that. Mm. And she says, but you love dead people. Where's the utility in that? So oh. our, our connection of love beyond the, beyond just the physical setting of, of space, if you know what I mean. Oh, wow. Love, love, love extending yeah. into time, love extending beyond gravity, love extending beyond, you know, the reality as we understand it, the metaphysics. So anyway, look, without bending our brains. Uh, oh, my, that, my, my, sorry, Julie, yeah. my, my brains went. Boom. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh, wow. Um, that's, wow. Yeah. yeah and man. without spoiling what happens, um, it, it's a great film, I think, for exploring this question um, because we talk about God's love. God's love is eternal. God's love, um, it reaches into our lives. We love the saints who have died. You know, so there's love going beyond, you know, someone who has died, who is there with God in heaven. We can love them uh, and we can be loved back by, back by God. Uh, so, uh, and that extends, uh, God's love extends beyond just our three-dimensional understanding of the way the world exists. So anyway, Caroline can do a science segment on this. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, but wow, anyway, wow, yeah. the, it's a pivotal point in the film for me because it's a gutsy thing to have a, a film that is very, very scientific, that, that actually it, it, it's, um, partly is based on the work of a scientist as well, to suddenly like, um, throw, a, you know, throw a wrench in the gears and, um, and say, but what about love? Because <laughs> I think yeah. a, lot of people who, a lot of people watch and go, well, I didn't watch this. You know, I like the science. Why are we now? What is this? Some kind of film where love saves everything? You know, oh, we've seen this before. So um, it's very provocative and challenging in that sense. And I think it's, it's worth having a discussion about, especially with nice. students. It's a great, cool. um, All right. it's a great wow. opener, great opener to the gospel in a philosophy class, I reckon. That's where, wow. that's where we're going with it. Wow. Yeah. Man. Okay. Okay. There you go. All right. So Interstellar. That's our, I wouldn't even, Interstellar. Oh wow, man. I wouldn't have. Mm, worth okay. watching. 
totally worth watching. You need to find three hours. You know, it's Lord of the Rings length, so you need to sit down and find a time when you can watch it. Um, just with it after the leader scenes. Yeah. 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 But definitely, definitely not a waste of time, I, I believe, watching it anyway. All right. So let's, um, let's wrap it up there. Um, so to wrap up the show today, we want to thank you all for joining us for episode 52 of The Catholics of Oz. Before we go... I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons, and I have a confession to make. I didn't ask Dob in time for a list of patrons, so today we, we want to thank all of the patrons of the Yay! network. Uh, we're grateful to all of you. Um, it, it is the patrons of, that keep SQPN going. It is because of you that we have a show. It's because of you that I ended up with Archbishop Comensoli last Wednesday night <laughs> to hear his beautiful speech and to beautiful. hear our podcast yes. being named as part of that, uh, as part of the mission of the church in Melbourne. Um, you know, and, and the discipleship that we're as imperfect as we are, that we're trying to offer. Definitely, so definitely. because of all of you patrons, that's a, that's a one direct effect that your, um, that your patronage has done to support us. So through all the generous donations of the, of the patrons of SQPN, they gave it, they give it sqpn.com slash give, and they make it possible for the Catholics of Oz and all of the other shows on StarQuest, not only to continue, but to continue the message of the gospel and to reach out to other people. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron. Thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter, when you start a new patron monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor. So if you become a patron at $10 per month, after three months, our donor will give $30 to StarQuest to support all of our shows, including this one. So make your gifts go further. If you've been thinking about becoming a patron, now is a great time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. Also, we would love to know what you think about what we discussed in today's show. Uh, what do you think of the words of Archbishop Comensoli? How are those words challenging to you? What are those words making you think about your own discipleship wherever you are in your context, whether you're in the Archdiocese of Melbourne, in wider Australia, in somewhere else in the world? Uh, what... Um, how are you being called in the post-exile period when once you come out of lockdown or you know, once you are uh, back in the world and back at Mass and back in your parish, how are you called to be a disciple of Christ like, like we've been reflecting on? So you can send us feedback about that and about Interstellar and your favorite TV shows as well um, by visiting sqpn.com slash oz where you can also find our show notes and a link to Archbishop Commonsoli's Patrick Oration speech, which we'll put in the notes. You can also visit us at uh, facebook.com slash starquestmedia. And don't forget that we have our own Catholics of Oz Facebook page at facebook.com slash Catholics of Oz spelt O-Z and uh, where you can join us in discussing our latest episodes. We can also be reached by email at catholicsofoz at sqpn.com. Lino, thank you so much for being on the show today. It has been totally interstellar. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, that's, that's, a... that's so bad. Oh, man. Okay. Wow. That's okay. good. We'll go with that. All right. I can't, you know what? I can't even think of a comeback. For that. I'm going to let you own that. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. I can't believe I'm... Oh, okay. All good. Take care, everyone. Good. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I'm Lindsay Sand. Thank you for joining us for episode 52 of The Catholics of Oz on StarQuest. <laughs>